Welcome to IQ Hit List. I'm Vishwa Sadashivan. IQ Hit List is inconvenient questions, one-on-one -on -one interview that explores the views of an individual that you want to see. Now, my guest today is, you can say, he's on call 24-7. His days and nights are spent championing the rights of a group that works day and night in transient existence. He's many things to many people. A professional busybody, an unyielding rebel with a cause, and for some Singaporeans, a traitor. And to others, well, what can I say? A royal pain where the sun doesn't shine. Now, here's Jolivan Wam, Executive Director of Home or Humanitarian Organization for Migration Economics. In the next 20 minutes, we will try and find out why this man chose a path that few would contemplate, and even fewer would have the courage or the stamina to take. Jolivan has been crusading the rights of migrant workers in Singapore for the past, well, more than 10 years, since he was 25, 26, 24, 24, yeah. 24 years old. Jolivan, welcome. Uh, thank thank you. you for making time for this, you know. Um, why, why do you do this? Now, the reason why I'm asking is most Singaporeans, especially after you've got a degree, the last thing you want to do is to go and make foreign fighting for foreign workers and migrant workers your day-to-day -day business you know I'm, sh I'm sure you're not paid a huge amount of money certainly not what um, mm. admin service officers are paid <laughs> you know so, so what that. makes you do this okay well my background is in social work so that was what I studied at the university so I've always been interested in wanting to um, contribute to those who are disadvantaged and those who are marginalized um, I decided on migrant workers because of my own experience um, having lived and grown up with domestic workers because my mom had five children so it was not easy taking care of five brats so, <laughs> um, so she needed someone to assist her and I used to sleep in the same room as my domestic worker and now when I think back how awful that must have been for her, for her because yes. I was very talkative and I didn't allow her to sleep so <laughs> and, and her private space. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, so domestic yeah. workers don't have much private space. They're always at work. Even when they're resting, they're still on standby. So I can sympathize with that. And was I, there any particular incident that that, that struck a chord mm. that, that remains in your mind? Yes. I mean I remember when my my mom decided to give our Indonesian domestic worker um, a day off. And um, the resulting reactions from her friends really um, struck me because um, they told her that if she had a day off, she would go out and have a Bangladeshi boyfriend and then she'll get pregnant or she'll start to have an attitude problem and not do her work well. Or worse still, she might start to gossip with other domestic workers and teach them <laughs> to instigate employers so that they can have more free time and more days off. So, so the mm. bottom line, I mean, and, and things haven't changed very much. In fact, I would say in, in some instances, things may have worsened, right? There's this sense we have that foreign workers, migrant workers, whether they're domestic workers or not, are less of a human being than we are. Mm. which means that they are entitled, entitled to less. Yes. Right? I mean, I remember being on a train once, you know, uh, and this is, it was in the evening ride home and there was this migrant worker who came in. Obviously, he smelled of perspiration because mm. he'd been working the whole day. Right. No, you expect him to take a cab home, <laughs> right? Right. And you should have seen the expressions on, in, in, in the people around him. Mm. Some of them actually said, wow, it's you know, he's so smelly, you know, and, and they actually did that, did that mm, in front of him mm, and then they looked at him. And, I, and that poor guy, I still remember the expression on his face, you know, he felt so low and I think he would have done anything to get out of the train immediately, mm, you know. Mm. Uh, and he kept saying, I'm sorry, sorry, eh? mm. sorry to the people. Right. Sorry for what? Mm. What nationality or Indian. race was he? He was Indian. Indian, mm, right. in, Indian or Bangladeshi, I, I mm. don't know, but... Uh, you see, it was very sad, mm. you know, it was very sad for me to see that. Uh, of course, there were a few other people, Singaporeans, who also felt, I could see, felt very upset mm. about what they witnessed. Mm. But this is the plight, mm. right? And, and we are not paying enough attention to, how does this reflect on us? Right. You know, so tell us some of the things that you've had to deal with. 
mm. you know, in, in the course of your work. Right. Yeah, I mean, okay, just back to this example yeah. in the UK, it's, it's a combination really of um, racism and classism, right? Because mm. um, in Singapore society, we are racist in the sense that we see Indians as belonging to a category of people who are dirty and smelly and always getting mm. drunk, etc. Mm. The stereotypes. Uh, yeah, so these kinds of stereotypes are also quite prevalent. Yeah. And, and, and that is exacerbated by the fact that this guy is a construction worker. So they're doing the kinds of jobs that many Singaporeans don't want to do anymore. And yeah. you look down upon. That's right, yeah. And these are jobs and, and, and the kinds of aspirations that Singaporeans have now are very different. Right? We talk about the five C's, for instance. Mm. Yeah, so I've not heard anybody say when they grow up they want to be a construction worker. Yeah, so we look down on these kinds of jobs. So it's a combination of these kinds of factors that result in this kind of discrimination against um, these workers. And this discrimination is also aided by our laws and our policies which reinforce these kinds of thinking, these kinds of negative And this is something you've been trying to fight with, fight against, um, sensitize, as well as negotiate with the government, yes, right? Yes, uh, in particular, right. the Ministry of Manpower, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. can, you, can you share with me um, one particular aspect of legislation you know, mm. that you've been trying to persuade the government you know, mm. to, to change? Right. Um, the right to switch employers. Okay. Yeah, this, for us, is a very important issue. Why? Um, well, migrant workers, when they come into Singapore to work, um, they often pay huge recruitment fees. So they are indebted by the time they Can arrive. Can you give me a sense of what? Um, say if you're a Bangladeshi worker, for instance, you could pay up to $10,000. just Singapore? For yeah, 10000 Singapore dollars just for an opportunity to work here. So, and their basic salaries could be something like five to $600 a month. But their basic salaries for those who are severely abused could be as low as just 150 or 160 an hour. Wow. So $1.50. That's right. That's right. So we have seen these, these kinds of cases. They are, they are rare, but they do happen. And there is very little redress for them when a situation like this arises for them. So many of them may be tricked or deceived um, of the nature of their work or their working conditions. So by the time they arrive, they realize, hey, you know, I've found, I'm, I'm stuck in this exploitative situation. Yeah, but there's nothing I can do about it yeah, because we don't have laws and policies which allow them to switch employers freely. So this results in these workers continuing to endure abuse and exploitation just so that they won't be terminated and they'll be sent back with this huge debt. Yeah, so this is one issue that we've been trying to So how long, with. Jolivan, how yeah. long does it take for, for a Bangladeshi worker who has committed 10,000 10, US dollars, I mean 10,000 Singapore dollars or US dollars, mm. Singapore dollars. Singapore dollars. Now, 10,000 dollars is a huge amount of money for yes, them. Right? that's right. Now, how long would it take if, you, if, if your salary is, say, uh, $600? Right. Right? How long would it take for them, for him to make enough money? Right. Well, when they arrive here, they yeah. usually expect to be given a lot of overtime work. Yeah. yeah. So that with the basic salary of just five or six hundred dollars, it will add up to about thousand dollars. Okay. Yeah. So that is if they work, say, like twelve hours a day. Okay. Yeah. Seven which many of them week. do. Yes. Which many of them do seven days a week. So it would take over a year, or even one and a half years, to be able to pay off the, the debt. But because they also have to to, to pay yeah. for the expenses while they're living as in As well as to right. repatriate money, right? That. Yes, that's right, and to remit money back home. Yeah. So, but they see the first year or so of their employment here as an opportunity to just to repay the cost of coming here. So after that, then they will start to earn money. Right. So it's an investment. Yeah. So, so you settle the, the, the capital expense, so to speak. That's right. right. Yeah. After one half years. That's, mm -hmm. Then that's where the actual benefit of coming here to work kicks in, right? Yes, that's now, right. So, have you come across instances where they are perhaps unfairly terminated mm. uh, for things that they may not have been guilty of? And then, do they have recourse, for example? Mm. I mean, if, if I'm a foreign worker and uh, my, my boss is abusive and uh, at some point uh, he just does, doesn't like my face and he says, I'm going, mm. to, I'm going to sack you. Yes. Uh, yes. What recourse do I have? Well, you, system? you literally have none. I mean, you can appeal to the Manpower Ministry to okay. allow them to switch, to let you switch employers. Yeah, but this is done on a case-by-case -case basis. So there's but no do, law but or policy that guarantees that. But do they even know the system? They These don't, workers. you see, they don't. <laughs> yeah, they're not aware that they can do that. Yeah. Yes. And, um, and officers on the ground at the Manpower Ministry 
may not necessarily inform them that they can do that. Okay. Yeah. So, so many of them just get sent back home. So how are you informed of it? How is home informed of this? Do they call you, these workers? Yes. I yes. Mean, how do they know that you exist? Mm, we, have, we do outreach work yeah. Yeah, and also through word of mouth. Mm. Because we've been around for about 11 years, so <coughs> workers know about what we do, so they come to us directly for help. So a lot of my work involves having to make appeals to the authorities mm. yeah, to highlight an injustice and say, this has happened, so we hope that you can take this into consideration and give these concessions so that these, these workers don't have to go back and face this huge debt that they have incurred. And, and would you say that uh, the authorities are coming around to, to working with you in, in, in some of these areas? Um, when we started, it was more difficult. <coughs> yeah, I think, um, I guess, uh, the Manpower Ministry was still trying to um, establish um, their relationship with us and also to grapple with, these, with yeah. these issues. Because I think a lot of these things that were happening on the ground, um, um, the, the people in government weren't necessarily even aware of them. Yeah. Yeah, so it takes NGOs like us to highlight it, yeah, to publicize it, and to and, raise awareness. And, and to raise awareness and mm -hmm. to socialize. That's right. right? That's right. Um, so things have improved, would you say? Well, m they have, but it, it hasn't been that significant okay. that it's cr um, created the kind of systemic changes that we want to see. So what's, what do you think is, is holding back? The authorities from from actually working a lot closer with NGOs such as you, uh, TWC2, and, and many other NGOs mm. have come up. Mm. Uh, what what's stopping the authorities from working closer? I, with well, you? I mean, they do work with us. So, in the in the sense that we refer cases to them, okay, we will um, email them. So we have direct channels of communication okay. with them. What they just don't like is when you become very public in your disagreements with them mm. or when you do campaigns or when you um, um, exert some form of public pressure yeah, for, for laws and policies. Why do you change. resort to that instead of working with them behind the scenes? Why do you resort to, to public pressure? Well, that's because change doesn't happen simply because you have these cosy conversations with policy makers and mm. ministers. Mm. Yeah, change happens because um, the uh, Singaporeans are sensitised, because there is external pressure, mm. yeah, because um, we we campaign and push for these laws and policies to change. Yeah. So I don't believe in this model where you just sit you know, behind closed doors uh, and, and dialogue and try to work these things out. Why, um, why don't you believe in that? Um, I believe that as, as a social worker, as an activist, you must have a, uh, like a diverse range of tools you know, mm. in your toolkit. Mm. So sometimes dialogue helps. So mm. I'm not saying that you know, dialogue doesn't help. Um, isn't important. Or, or just even behind the scenes, you know, quietly dealing with each yes, issue. Yes, yes, right? that's right. So, yeah. so we do engage in these types of advocacy. Mm. So we do have meetings with MOM, we do research and documentation, we request to meet with them and we discuss our findings, our recommendations. So these things do happen. But I think it has to be one part of your advocacy. You cannot just only stick to But when strategy. you do the, the, the public... Um, expression uh, of, of disgruntlement, for example, mm. you know, doesn't make, doesn't it make the equation a lot more uh, adversarial? Mm. And then doesn't it then force the authorities to take an adversarial confrontationist stance against you? Well, they don't have to do that. The problem here is that so-called adversarial or confrontational approaches are stigmatized. Mm. Right? So it is the job of civil society groups all over the world yeah, to, to campaign and to, and to do advocacy and to express public disagreement. But just because I express public disagreement doesn't mean I am... You're the enemy of the state. I'm the enemy of the state, exactly. Mm. Yeah. What I want is for, for the, the people that I'm, I'm helping, my beneficiaries, to have a better life. Would you say that public sentiment Mm. You know, when, because when you do public advocacy, right? Mm. When you make speeches, when you hold rallies and so on. Do, do you believe that more and more Singaporeans are, are coming around to, to appreciating the need for us to be more humane, more decent mm. in the way we, we, we treat um, foreign workers, migrant mm. workers? You know? I think there is a fair bit of awareness among mm. Singaporeans that um, we do have a system which allows um, which allows employers to exploit workers very badly to the extent mm. that, we, that it's like modern-day slavery. Mm. Yeah, so there are many people who are aware of this. So 
um, but I don't. We haven't seen that kind of um, seismic uh, mm. attitudinal shifts, of course. Mm. Yeah, but this is something that that takes time and something which. Well, is it also because of the political culture, social political culture of Singaporeans? You know, we we tend to be very quiet about mm. these things. It doesn't mean we don't feel it. Mm. Uh, we we don't necessarily vocalize it. Mm. You know, uh, because my own sense is you know, in talking to a lot of people, right? Um, they they get it. Mm. They're beginning to get it, especially young people I talk to, they begin to see... Uh, I, I think young people are a lot more conscious of fairness, mm. justice and, and notions mm. like that. Um, I feel that there's more hope mm. going forward. Mm. You know, mm. we are beginning to see a generation that is less class conscious in that sense. Mm. You know, more egalitarian, uh, more concerned about justice. Mm. Um, so, uh, we, we, we need to wrap now, but let me ask you this. If there is one scenario that you want to paint for our viewers, a stark scenario uh, that could translate into an inconvenient question mm. that you want to provoke thought in our viewers. Mm. What would that be, Jonathan, in this space? Mm. Um, if all our migrant workers and migrant domestic workers went on strike, what would you do? Would you be able to um, would life be able to continue as the way it has? Would we be able to live without migrant workers and migrant domestic workers? I think this is a very important question which um, Singaporeans need to consider. Yeah. The response to that from, from most people would be, it is improbable that something like this will happen. Mm. It is improbable that something like this will happen, but when it does, then we realise the immense contributions that they make to our country and our economy. And I make this point because we, when we don't, we don't realise how important they are. And, and, that does, and because we don't realise that, it hasn't translated into better protections and better social services for them. And we take it for granted. That's right. We say we need them, yeah. But every year, for instance, when, when the government announces its budget, there is nothing for migrant workers. There are no social support services. Our laws and our policies continue to discriminate against them. So we cannot say that we want them and we need them, but yet not do anything to ensure that their rights are upheld, their welfare is taken care of, and their dignity is um, respected. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, this, is, this is, as usual, my conversation with you is very sobering. It, 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 it most certainly makes me feel guilty for, for <laughs> honestly, I mean, I'm being very honest. And if it doesn't make me feel guilty, something is wrong. Something is wrong with me. Okay. Uh, I think I feel a bit normal feeling guilty okay. after listening to you because, and, and I hope all of, all of us watching this would have a sense of guilt because it's not enough for us to empathize. At some point, we need to take a stand. You know, not because we want to go against the system, go against the authorities, but I think from a simple point of decency that I think Singaporeans should take more seriously. Uh, this has been IQ Hit List with Jolovan Brown. Log into our website www.iq.sg to watch out for our next IQ Hit List. Click the links to see other guests who have appeared on our previous episodes. Post your comments on social media and let us know if there's someone you would like us to interview on Hit List.